Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of our Green NY Sustainability Series of Webinars. My name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the co-chair of the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee and would like to thank you for taking the time to jump on the line today and learn how you can stop the spread of invasive species here in New York. A couple housekeeping items while we get started. Uh, everyone is on mute right now when you join. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Green New York website afterwards. So if you'd like to share it with any of your coworkers or if there's any slides you'd like to go back and see again, uh, you can go back and view those on the Green New York website. If you do have a question as we go along, you can type it into the chat box. We will be uh, addressing all of the questions at the end of the presentation today, uh, so we will get to them. Just make sure you type them in the chat box. A couple other uh, housekeeping items here. Uh, it is Plastic Free July, so if you're looking for something that you can do on the sustainability front, uh, it's a great time to think about how you can reduce the amount of single-use plastics uh, that you're creating. Uh, this could be as simple as remembering to have a coffee mug or a, a uh, water bottle in the car to using reusable grocery bags. Um, or even looking at things like bar shampoo and conditioner and bar soap as opposed to plastic items. So think about that. Uh, if you Google Plastic Free July, you'll learn more about the initiative. Uh, our upcoming webinar for August is going to be on textile recycling. That's taking place on Tuesday, August 13th at noon. Uh, and that's another good topic with some um, pretty good tips. I know we all have some ripped clothing or other things that we want to make sure are properly disposed of. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Emma Antolos and Brian Esnar uh, talking about invasive species here. It is Invasive Species Awareness Week, so this did line up pretty well. And uh, here we go. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Emma Antolos. I am the Invasive Species Education and Outreach Coordinator uh, with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm tagging teaming here with Brian, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Oh. <laughs> All right, so invasive species are non-native plants, animals, insects, and pathogens that can cause harm to the environment, economy, and or human health. Um, so here we have some photos, a wide array of invasive species that you guys may be familiar with, such as northern snakehead and an aquatic invasive fish um, that can survive a few days out of water. Um, we also have giant hogweed, an invasive um, plant. Uh, it's actually brought over as an ornamental plant, and if you get the sap on your skin and it's exposed to sunlight, you can actually um, get severe burns. Um, and another invasive um, we have on the right uh, photo there is emerald ash borer, um, which is pretty prevalent in New York State. Um, I think about 8% or 9% of our trees in New York State are ash, and emerald ash borer's only host is ash trees, so they are slowly killing all of our ash trees across New York State. Um, so those are a few examples. Um, so in base, oh, excuse me. <laughs> All right. uh, so um, as international trade increases, so is the rate of invasive species introductions. Um, so there's a wide array of different ways and uh, pathways that invasive species can get here. Um, so I included a few here. Um, by no means are these the only ways that invasive species can get here. Um, so you know, ship ballast water. Um, so you know, ships from their point of origin, like in Europe, Asia, um, they take on a bunch of ballast water and they come to um, our country country and uh, dump that ballast water in our waterways. Um, and unfortunately, those can often contain um, quite a few invasive species. Another pathway is um, actually um, uh, those wood pallets. You see that middle photo there. Um, a lot of uh, wood boring insects like to hang out in there, such as emerald ash borer or Asian longhorn beetle. Firewood is another big pathway, um, so a lot of people uh, will remove, uh, cut down wood on their property and transport it across great distances, and unfortunately, um, a lot of invasive insects can, um, and diseases as well, can hitch rides via that firewood. Um, so New York State actually has firewood um, regulations in place um, that requires you to, um, any firewood that you cut down yourself, you have to limit that movement to 50 miles from the point of origin. Um, on the aquatic side, um, uh, we also have uh, recreational boating um, is a huge uh, vector of aquatic invasive species. So unfortunately, a lot of boats, um, you know, jet skis, canoes, kayaks can transport um, a lot of these invasive plant materials and organisms. 
Um, the nursery trade is another big pathway. Um, you know, we get a lot of uh, plant species from, you know, overseas, um, and they unfortunately, you know, are not native to our environment and unfortunately can take over. Um, another big vector um, is uh, aquarium dumping, so people who have uh, plants or animal species that no longer want them will often dump them into a nearby body of water, and unfortunately that's how um, you know, hydrilla, an aquatic invasive plant, has taken over, um, as well as some invasive fish. Actually, goldfish have become um, invasive in certain parts of um, this country. Um, because of people dumping them when they don't want them or they believe them to be dead. Uh, so what makes invasive species successful? Um, due to their rapid growth, they kind of take over an environment. They often tolerate wide range of habitat conditions, so they really can thrive in certain environments that others don't. For example, um, you have uh, Phragmites, which is commonly found along roadsides that are extremely salty and have a lot of chemicals um, in the soil, and they grow perfectly well in there in that sort of environment compared to you know, our native species, which might not do so hot there. Um, they often also lack native predators, so nothing will prey on it, nothing will eat it, um, so their populations are able to um, skyrocket. Um, they often compete with native species for resources, um, and they also have reproductive advantages, so um, they will produce a lot of eggs or seeds, and um, you know, unlike our native, a lot of our native species. So why should we care about invasive species? Um, they essentially threaten nearly every aspect of our world and one of our greatest threats to New York's biodiversity. So you have spotted lanternfly, I think that Brian will talk about in a little bit, um, attacking um, some of those grape um, plants there. Um, there's water chestnut, which I know a lot of folks in the capital region are familiar with, um, clogging up local waterways. Um, so you know they impact us in, in a lot of ways that we might not even be familiar with. Um, they cause habitat degradation and loss. Um, they cause the loss of native fish, wildlife, and tree species, the loss of recreational opportunities and income, um, as well as crop damage and diseases in humans and livestock. So um, they're not just an ecological problem. They also in, um, really impact um, the economy as well as human health. So um, there's lots of things that you can do to prevent the spread of invasive species. It's not all doom and gloom. There's lots that we can um, do to help quell the spread. Um, like I mentioned before, firewood is a huge vector of invasive species, um, especially um, insects and diseases of trees. Um, so definitely make sure you obey are obeying those firewood regulations that we have in New York State. Um, so make sure you're not, you know, uh, cutting down firewood and moving at long distances across New York State, um, that you can buy local firewood, you know, from, you know, if you're going camping up north in that Adirondacks, um, you know, you can wait till you get up north to buy the firewood and make sure it's local. Um, another great uh, way to prevent the spread is make sure you're clean draining and drying your watercraft. So you see that photo down there of uh, the boat um, covered in aquatic material, a uh, plant material. It's just to make sure you're removing all of that before you go to another body of water. Um, you know, any little fragment, unfortunately, of a plant species can regrow. Um, so it's really important to be diligent when you're cleaning your watercraft. And it's not just motorized watercraft, it's, you know, any anything like a paddleboard or a kayak or canoe. Another quick thing to note too is even when you're going hiking or you know you're out camping, just make sure you're cleaning your gear and clothing and any other equipment when you're going um, you know in an infested area. So you know if you're hiking and you notice that there might be um, I don't know uh, garlic mustard nearby, um, is to make sure you're not transporting any seeds. You know whether that be on your clothing or in your boots. So just be diligent about cleaning before and after so you're not spreading to an uninfested area. And finally, uh, another great tip for your folks um, is to make sure you're um, knowing where your um, plants are that you're planting. Um, make sure you're not 
uh, buying any exotic plants, make sure you're using uh, plants native to New York State. Um, so a lot of plants sometimes will be labeled, but you know if you might have to be a little extra diligent about um, seeking um, you know native plants. And there's plenty of resources to guide you um, to you know wh why, what uh, plants are native in New York State, and uh, we can definitely provide those for you. Um, and also just be aware of what's in your seed mixes. A lot of times you'll get these um, packets that might be, um, you know, God knows what. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're, you know, doing your due diligence before you plant anything. Uh, a few other tips too, um, make sure you're not releasing any exotic pets or plants into the wild. You hear about those horror stories out there in Florida of people finding, uh, you know, those uh, the, uh, Burmese pythons yep. <laughs> in their backyards. Um, so definitely make sure you're not releasing anything. You know, if you can, donate it or, you know, take it back to the pet store, find a local school um, that might want to take in a plant, uh, plant or animal. Another thing, too, is just get involved. Uh, make sure you're um, aware of your local partnership for regional invasive species management. Um, we have eight prisms across New York State, so if you want to get more involved, you can hook up with them, and they have plenty of volunteer opportunities. Um, uh, and then finally, we have this great resource in New York State called IMAP Invasives. Um, they have uh, both an online component and an application on your phone that you can report any invasive species that you see out in your backyard or when you're on a hike. Um, and there's plenty of training opportunities if you want to explore that. Um, so if you want to go to uh, visit NewYorkIMAPInvasives.org, you can find out more about um, that application. It's really fun, a lot, very user-friendly and easy to do. Um, and finally, um, like Brendan mentioned before, it's Invasive Species Awareness Week this week, July 7th through the 13th. There's lots of opportunities for you guys to get involved. Um, if you visit that website I listed there, stoptheinvasionny.com slash events. Um, definitely check it out. Um, and for those of you in Albany, we'll actually be at the Empire State Plaza Farmers Market tomorrow at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you want some more information, we'll be there. Lots of great organizations. Um, and yeah, definitely check out. There's, I think last time I checked, over 170 events across uh, New York State. So there's definitely some uh, really fun ones. Check it out um, uh, and visit that website. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Brian, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, specific invasive insects and plants. Thanks, Emma. I'm Brian Eschenauer with Cornell's Integrated Pest Management Program. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about invasives and then talk about some good native alternatives. Super tiny. <laughs> All right, so the first one, uh, before we get into talking about native plants and those alternatives, I want to uh, highlight one of the uh, invasive species that we're concerned about in the Integrated Pest Management Program because it poses a threat to uh, some of our agricultural crops that are important in New York. So here you can see clusters of these spotted lanternflies feeding on um, apples and grapes. And this is just uh, south of us in Pennsylvania where this is taking place. So um, many experts feel that we will see a live infestation in New York, uh, somewhere in New York this year. So we're really on the lookout for this. And this is just to show you these pictures because this is an insect that is easily recognizable. Nothing else really looks like this. So you can be the eyes uh, out there that identifies this and in fact, there have been some uh, non-scientists who identified this in New York. They were dead insects, fortunately, so we don't have a live infestation that we know about at this point. Um, I was giving this presentation in the Rochester area um, in the winter, and somebody said, uh, hey, my uh, nephew has this. He lives in Pennsylvania. I was down there and visiting him, and um, this is how he was handling it on his trees. I don't know if you can see it, but there's clusters of the spotted lanternflies there, and he was using a shop vac <laughs> to get them off. They do <laughs> exude uh, honeydew that uh, can coat the uh, anything that's underneath them, so they can be a nuisance at the home, although they uh, aren't known to kill uh, landscape trees. They will weaken them. 
Just a little bit about the spotted lanternfly. It does look different at different times of the year. Right now, it's not the large um, insect that it will be later in the season. Uh, shortly in August, we'll see that very recognizable um, larger insect. Right now, it's dark to either black or black and red and spotted, and I'll go through some of the pictures here. Starting out with the eggs, the egg masses are pretty well disguised. They can blend into bark or stones. Uh, they're often covered with this, um, like a mud-like matrix that the female puts down over the eggs. You can see the eggs in a line there on the right, and some of them are covered over. So it's believed that it arrived in the U.S. in a stone, landscaping stone, in a stone yard in Pennsylvania, and that was uh, that came in from Asia. So they can move around uh, on these egg masses, and the females can lay those egg masses on just about anything. It doesn't have to be a tree, as I mentioned, it could be stones, it could be a vehicle even. So that's something we're really looking for. Um, here's a couple images of the immature spotted lanternflies, starting out with a black and white and moving over to some red coloration. And there's the mature. It is a plant hopper. It looks like a moth in this picture, but it's a, a large insect in the plant hopper family. And normally you don't see those uh, orange underwings there, but it does have a reddish color through the uh, transplant, uh, transparent overwings there. Spotted lanternfly really likes Alanthus. Uh, in fact, there's research underway to see if it's required for this insect to uh, reproduce. Alanthus is not a planted landscape tree, but it's very common. It's very tolerant to urban conditions, and it self-seeds pretty uh, readily, so it can be found um, in quite a few places. Um, it is, has a large pinnate leaf, so a lot of leaflets on it and it has a lobe, and that's what that circle is highlighting there. There's a little lobe at the end of the leaf and at the base of the leaflet, and that separates this from other plants that have uh, pinnate leaves, and that would be like uh, black walnut or sumac. This one has that lobe there. Uh, this is some of the symptoms. Uh, you can get the yellowing, the flagging on mature trees, and the uh, sappy exudate running down the trunk or onto whatever is below the tree. There is some hope, there's some biological control that may eventually uh, help us manage this. Um, there's a lot of research underway. This is still a, a relatively new insect, so uh, we're learning a lot about it and the potential controls for it. Right now, we're asking if you see uh, anything that looks like spotted lanternfly to take a picture of that and send that in an email or in as an attachment on an email to this web uh, to this email that was set up at the DEC spotted lanternfly at dec.newyork.gov and um, because it's so recognizable, this uh, really should help us uh, know if that's what you have. And it is also possible to uh, report this through IMAPS and bases. Um, all right, now switching over to the plant end of things and thinking of invasive species there, uh, New York State was forward thinking and it's one of uh, several states that have invasive species regulations now. And that went into effect in 2015. There are 69 species of invasive plants that are on this list. Some of them are prohibited, prohibited and others are regulated, including some common uh, trees like uh, Norway maple, burning bush, barberry, and honeysuckle. Uh, Norway maple is so common and that is a regulated species that has to have special labeling if you were to try to purchase one of those. Um, and you won't have a DEC officer pull up into your front yard. It's not going to happen because if it did, I would have one in my front yard. I still have some of these uh, species that are there in my old landscape. I'm trying to uh, uh, turn those over into getting some native species there. Um, and are they really a problem in nature? Uh, yes, they are. It doesn't take long. Once you have a trained eye, you can see them out there. At first, uh, you know, I was hearing about some of the species that are a problem in the south uh, that we don't have here. 
but as soon as I started looking, I could find things like the honeysuckle and uh, Norway maple uh, really encroaching on our native species. Here's some barberry um, plants that are a problem in the forest floor, and they not only choke out some of our native plants and wildlife uh, and wildflowers, they also uh, elevate the numbers of ticks and uh, because of the humidity that's there and the ticks really like, they also uh, protect the white-footed mouse from a lot of predators because of the, the nature of barberry. And you can see a lot more uh, Lyme-infected ticks in an area that has Japanese barberry. But uh, they've done some studies, and if it's possible, it's a lot of work, but if the stands are eliminated, you can bring back uh, the wildlife and the wildflowers and reduce the, uh, the ticks. So it is possible to go back. I want to talk about the alternatives to some of these invasive species. We've got a lot of good native species that are out there that can really fill in these roles and, and serve the environment as well as being an attractive part of the landscape. This, um, the list that I'm going to talk about is online, the New York State IPM program, alternatives to invasives, if you put that in uh, and the word Cornell to Google, you will see that site. And I want to talk about natives just for a second here. So this is uh, a native maple and I volunteer on the board for a old growth forest in upstate New York. And late last summer, somebody brought me this leaf and I said, look at this, uh, something's eating at this. What is wrong here? You know, what do we need to do? And my answer is absolutely nothing. This tree is doing exactly what it's supposed to. It is feeding some native caterpillars that in turn will be food for native birds. The birds will have their droppings on the ground that'll help fertilize the trees. So this is actually what you want to see, a little bit of feeding like this. It's not harmful to the tree, and yet it's critical for our environment. So uh, maples can um, feed hundreds of native insects. Uh, just making the point here that uh, it is important uh, to have these uh, native plants in our landscape. And we're going to take a look at some of the uh, invasive species and then some of the alternatives that uh, we might want to consider instead of something uh, like Japanese barberry. So that's Japanese barberry. You can see why it was uh, useful in the landscape. There are all kinds of varieties, a lot of different colors, including these burgundy colored varieties. But there are some non-invasive plants that work really well, including the Wigilia here, uh, and there's a whole uh, number of them in a series that have this burgundy color. They're, they remain small and they are not invasive. Uh, there's also the native nine bark. Uh, there's the Diablo that has a, a purplish color as well as a dwarf one called uh, Little Devil. <laughs> and here they're being used in a demonstration garden as hedges. Japanese bar Barbary also has yellow colored varieties. And again, there's some Wigilia that have the yellow color to them, or chartreuse. There are so, uh, also are some Japanese Barbary cultivars that don't produce fruit and allow them to be uh, approved for sale in New York. So probably won't find these uh, too often out there yet, but be aware that they're coming. and. New York has this provision to allow uh, sterile cultivars to be used. Another invasive that's on the list is the angelica tree. It was used uh, a little bit in the landscape here. You can see a couple landscape shots of it. And uh, one of the alternatives is the pagoda dogwood, cornus alternifolia. It also has that kind of horizontal branching pattern that the Aurelia has. Uh, something that's a similar size that's a great native is the witch hazel and this is great in the late winter, early spring when we really need to see some signs of 
warmer uh, weather and spring conditions when bees bloom early. Some of them will even bloom in, uh, in the middle of winter. And here again in a hedge demonstration garden, it could be used in that kind of format. Often it's used in a landscape as a feature and I would, if you're considering using that, I would encourage you to put it in the front of the landscape, not way in the backyard because you want to be able to view this while it is blooming and that might happen in the uh, winter when there's still some snow on the ground and you could miss it. So this is actually in front of a library in the Rochester area and those flowers are very fragrant as well. Uh, so bamboo, I think we've probably, most of us have seen bamboo that's gone wild. It is very impressive uh, with the amount that it can spread in a single year. And so that is on the list of uh, prohibited or banned. One of the alternatives that doesn't look exactly like that, it doesn't have the upright look, but it does form a grove, and this is the bottle brush buckeye there. It, it also has the bonus that it flowers in midsummer. Not uh, too many other things are flowering in midsummer. Most of our shrubs are spring flowers. This one uh, does that in another two or three weeks. Uh, the bottle brush buckeye is around, will be uh, in bloom. My dog's there on the walk with me uh, as for scale, but uh, <laughs> corgi, so that, uh, I'll let you know that. Uh, for that upright look, another alternative for bamboo would be something like uh, the big blue stem. And this was native to New York in the pocket prairies that occurred in New York, and it really likes full sun as that upright habit. And uh, this picture shows big blue stem in the back behind the volunteers that are weeding there and little blue stem in the front. And little blue stem is smaller only related to big blue stem. Little blue stem can also uh, get up to be about six feet where big blue stem could get to be eight feet tall when it's mature. Another invasive that is an old-fashioned landscape plant that many older homes have is the privet, the border privet. And it's these fruit that the birds eat and then as they pass through the digestive system and get deposited wherever the bird's landing, they can pop up and uh, be an invasive plant. One of the alternatives to that could be the northern bayberry. This is very tolerant to salt uh, conditions. You can see it growing in coastal areas and it happens to be deer resistant. There are male and female plants, the female plants produce the uh, berries that are fragrant and are also um, what were used to make the bayberry candles. Another alternative is the, uh, well there's the, I'm sorry, the northern bayberry, just another shot of that. It can get quite large in time. And um, hollies, including this native holly, um, you can see this in the woods of Ohio and in some parts of New York, Ilex opaca. There are male and female plants for this too. The female plants will produce the berry. Uh, this one uh, will be good in zone six and some areas in zone five. The colder areas of New York can have a little bit of trouble with this one, but there are some other hollies, some deciduous hollies that you can consider for those areas including, here's a couple shots of deciduous hollies. Just, that means they're losing their leaves in the winter, but quite impressive uh, with the berries that just cover the branches and are not obscured by the leaves. Another holly, uh, also for a little bit warmer areas of New York, that's evergreen is the eekberry holly. So this could be a good substitute for something like taxis or yew as well. And our Native American uh, Arbor Vitae, you can see this when you're driving along the thruway, sometimes on uh, some of the cliff sides. So it is a, a nice native. However, it is susceptible to deer browse. So if that's an issue, or you just want to be aware that the lower, probably four feet, are often eaten by the deer. Um, I think we'll take uh, one more um, invasive here and then we'll wrap up and we'll have time to answer questions. So um, 
honeysuckles are invasive. We have some good alternatives here, including the red twig dogwood. I have this in my yard and I really like it. It's very forgiving and easy plant to grow. It likes really wet sites, but can tolerate uh, dry as well. Um, it has these red uh, branches that come up, give it a nice winter interest, and it has some flowers in the springtime. Here it is growing natively along uh, Woodlands area. I saw this this spring uh, with those bright red uh, branches there. And well, we'll finish up with burning bush here. Um, just the last one because it is so common. We want to hit that and some good alternatives, including my favorite plant of all here. So we'll cover that. Chokeberry is a great plant. It also has that good color that burning bush has in the fall. And uh, it has food for our native habitat, uh, birds and insects. This is my favorite, Fothergilla. So this is a plant that is out there now in the nursery trade. Um, it has these cool, interesting flowers that cover the plants in the springtime. And yeah, it has some good fall color too. So no need to plant the uh, Euonymus burning bush. We've got Fothergilla now that has flowers. The burning bush didn't have showy flowers. There it is in bloom. And here it is in the fall with a nice fall color. And so with that, I'll wrap up. Awesome, thank you very much. <clears throat> and with that, we'll move on to questions here. And I especially like the pictures um, and being able to see kind of side by side what the native alternatives are for a lot of these. Um, so let's go to the first question we have here. Uh, must the Asian longhorn beetle have spots? I found an identical insect that lacked spots. Okay, um, so there is a native insect, um, the white spotted pine sawyer, that often Asian longhorn beetle is uh, misidentified as. Um, so definitely encourage you to look uh, up actually on our website, on the EC's website, um, the side-by-side -side comparisons, because uh, about probably, I want to say 90% of the, well, actually 99% of the time, uh, the people think that they find Asian longhorn beetle, it is actually the white-spotted pine sawyer, which are native and out now. Um, so Asian longhorn beetle is in uh, Long Island area, you know, Queens, downstate. Um, so unless, you know, it hasn't really migrated north, um, our uh, partners at uh, USDA and Ag and Markets have been, done a really great job at keeping it down on in that area. Um, so again, if you're, you know, if you find it, we always want to know if, uh, you know, what you find, we'll be happy to identify it for you. Um, so definitely um, you can email us. Um, uh, we have an email dedicated to uh, forest insects. It's called foresthealth at dec.ny.gov and we'd be happy to identify it for you. But like I said, most commonly it's misidentified as uh, the pine sawyer. So definitely check it out. And yeah, again, we'd be happy to help you identify it. We have an entomologist on staff who could, could who can assist. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question here. I've heard that not all varieties of burning bush are invasive because there are newer sterile varieties. Is that true? Yeah, I think they're working on that. I don't believe that they've confirmed that they're uh, fully sterile, and I don't believe that they are yet approved for New York. But luckily, New York has that provision in, so when there's data to say that they are reliably sterile, they can be added to the list of approved species. Mm -hmm. Um, so, at the beginning, um, you mentioned international trade is a way that invasive species are spread. Um, are there any kind of certifications or good business practices for like shipping companies that you can look for um, or a way for the consumer to see that they're just buying from a company that's doing things to help stop the spread? Sure. I think, um, I think it's the Cary Institute who has this great program um, where they're encouraging businesses. I think it's called... Uh, Tree smart something um, where they're actually encouraging um, businesses to actually heat treat um, their pallets as well as using alternative materials for shipping so that wood boring insects can't be um, you know hitchhiking rides to the United States. 
Um, beyond that, I know there's some, um, you know, laws in place regarding ballast water and, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, shipping companies are not dumping, you know, zebra mussels and other aquatic invasives. Um, and in New York State, besides the regulations that Brian mentioned, um, we actually have regulations, um, you know, for anyone visiting New York State um, and going out on their watercraft, you actually have to make sure you uh, take reasonable precaution to clean, drain, and dry your boat and prevent the spread of invasive species. Um, I'm sure there's other laws and whatnot I'm missing, Brian. I think you covered it okay. well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What does the website mention that lists the native species alternatives? If you put in uh, Google, because I don't want to go through the long string, I think it would be helpful. Um, alternatives to invasives, Cornell, or alternatives to invasives, Cornell, IPM, it should be right up at the top and you'll see something that looks very similar to what uh, was on the screen with that slide. Mm -hmm. Are any of the plant alternatives you mentioned good bee hosts? Mm. Yeah, many of them are. In fact, I've just uh, over the last couple of weeks saw leaf cutter bees and leaf cutter bees are excellent pollinators and they will cut an almost perfectly, per uh, using the edge, a perfect circle um, out of a leaf of a native plant. I saw it on Redbud recently, which is another good native, and they take that leaf chunk back to uh, their nest, and they're a solitary bee, so they're not making a nest and, uh, that has a lot of bees in it, and they're very docile, they're not an aggressive bee. But that's one example, um, and some of them, like the Fothergilla, attracts um, other you know, bees and those kinds of insects. I like the question going back to uh, our webinar from last month as well. It's kind of formerly on Green New York Sustainability Series. Okay. We've got some pollinators. Um, so next question here. When you're at a nursery and you're looking for a kind of native plants, is there any kind of a native label that they can look for? Is there any kind of symbol, kind of like the New York Grown and Certified or Taste New York mm -hmm. or something like that, only for on the label of a plant that would say it's native? Often now I'm seeing on the label something that will indicate that um, it's native and it's not standardized, but sometimes they'll use the word native, they'll have a little symbol when they have, whether it's a high light plant or deer resistant, they, they often have, whether it's a native in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And because we have so many climates in New York, if it's native in the Northeast, it's normally always native in New York State. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets into the question of what we've talked about on previous webinars about greenwashing. I highly doubt it's something that takes place a lot of the times, but we look for kind of third-party certifications of various things. Mm -hmm. So is that something, do you know if there's anybody working on any kind of like a specific native label that would have like some sort of a deeper meaning to it than just anybody putting native on a plant at a, a nursery? It, it gets complicated because of the microclimates and what's native right in your area or what was native there. Um, so it's really hard to do and I'm not aware of that kind okay. of anyone taking that on. It sounds like mm -hmm. a good idea, but <laughs> it, it would be a tough job. Yeah. 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 And I think uh, the Department of Ag and Mark is actually, you know, that's their ballywick. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. They'd probably be able to answer that question better than mm -hmm. Brian or I. <laughs> um, yeah, we will. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, I know in the invasive world, a lot of plants are mislabeled um, and can be sold online. And it's just a very challenging thing to regulate, you know, completely. I know a lot of people, unfortunately, buy invasive aquatic plants to put in their aquarium thinking it's fine um, and that they're not, they don't realize that they're buying the invasive hydrilla because it's mislabeled often. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, just, it's just like Brian said, it's very challenging. Um, so I think it's just, it's really up to, you know, I really encourage folks, you know, to be an informed consumer and make sure you're aware and we have plenty of resources available between, you know, DEC and uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, you know, feel free to reach us out to us and we can definitely help. Yes, and on the upside, I think the uh, New York nursery and garden center industry has been great in removing all of those 
um, plants that are prohibited, so you, you're not seeing them out there anymore, and Ag and Markets has followed up on any cases where they found one. Uh, the one area, and you alluded to that, is online, and somebody selling a plant on Craigslist, uh, it might be something that is prohibited or regulated in New York State. And so that's something even uh, Ag and Markets has, has done a little bit of follow-up online, too. Mm -hmm. So we've got one more question here that I'm going to read off, but if anybody does have any questions they want to get in by the end, feel free to type them into the chat box here. Um, so earlier uh, I was mentioned for boats and like hiking equipment and things like that to clean, wash, and dry them before you go out. Um, is there anything you need to use more than water? Like we like to avoid pesticides in a lot of instances, but is this something where what should they be using for, to make sure that everything's completely um, inoc or, you know, taken care of? Yeah, um, we actually have um, boat uh, decontamination stations throughout New York State, um, and we just opened a boat wash station at exit 18 on the north way, um, right near Glens Falls. So what they do there, um, and I think they are available across New York State, um, is pressure wash your boat essentially. I think the recommended temperature is 140 degrees to kill off any, um, you know, hitchhikers, organisms that may be on there. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's the recommended temperature to, so if, if you have the means and can find a, you know, a boat wash station and all that information is available on our website, definitely encourage you to do so. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, making sure there's no, you know, washing all that stuff off, uh, draining it so there's no standing water and drying it. So if you can leave your watercraft out there to dry, you know, the solar, solarized essentially and kill off any uh, anything that might be you know, still hanging on there. Mm -hmm. And the final question we have here. I recently learned that ornamental pears, such as Bradford pear, are often invasive. I have four larger Bradford pears that are prominent in my landscaping. I'm now considering whether I should remove them. Are ornamental pears now considered invasive in New York? Yeah, there are <laughs> cases that uh, where we've seen the whole stands of uh, the ornamental pears. Uh, and so that is a concern. I wouldn't recommend it, recommend planting any. And yeah, it, in time, if you can take them out and consider a native plant in its place, that'd be fine. Our, uh, the pears that are culinary pears and apples are not invasive. It's, it's this uh, Bradford or calorie pear that's very invasive. Do you have anything to add? No, yeah, um, yeah and, and there, uh, do you have any recommendations for alternatives? That would be... Hmm. You know, uh, something that flowers in the spring time, um, a service berry is a great alternative. It is an early flowering, it's covered in, in white flowers like the pear would be, and it also has a fruit. It's a little earlier, they're on right now, and they're actually edible for us and birds like them as well. That's great. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you. Oh, we got one last one. <laughs> Are ginkgo trees or redbud trees invasive in New York State? Hmm. So ginkgos are not native, um, but I, I have not heard of any occurrences of them being invasive. Uh, redbuds can certainly self-seed, but they are a native plant. I don't think we're going to consider them invasive. Uh, I haven't seen them crowd out other plants. In a home landscape situation, uh, red buds can pop up in garden beds and I will pull them out, but uh, I think they, uh, they're well behaved in natural areas and you often see them just along the edge of a forest. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, we'd like to thank everybody for being on the webinar today. A reminder that there's a recording of this that will be put up on the Green New York website if you'd like to see any of the pictures of any of the plants or any of the other information. Uh, again, our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, August 13th at noon on textile recycling. Um, and it is Plastic Free July, so um, try and go plastic free if you can in as many areas as you can. So a big thank you again to Emma and Brian for presenting today. Uh, and if you do have any questions, send them over uh, afterwards via email and uh, we'll get those answered for you. Thanks a lot. Bye.